are set to go. Ha ha. Uh, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. So we are in 56 Twitter, and uh, I've worked up through basically your homework assignment. And uh, let's see what it looks like. I'm pretty dang happy with it. Took me a while. I like it. I like design. I like things that are very UX, user friendly. It's pretty, you know, um, and it makes sense. And so I was looking like how to do the login, and I got the login ideas from Google. I don't want to do it here because I'm actually logged in. But uh, I figure, you know, Google knows what the hell they're doing. All right? And uh, when you sign into Google, that's pretty much what it looks like. And they're just asking for your email. It's not email and password. All right? And then... <laughs> Really? You don't recognize that email? How would you know? <laughs> Joe at board.com recognizes that one. I'm not sure what kind of validation they were using there. Like they send it and it comes back instantly like, you know, that's not a real email, then you can't use it. That's pretty wild. So you get the username and then you get the password. That's pretty cool, right? And uh, so that's sort of what I was like looking at when I was like, okay, how should I build this? And um, you go to log in. You could. I, I was like, we're just doing it on one screen, though. You could do, uh, you know, I was like trying to get error messages to show up here. So this is just in the design phase. I was just sort of putting them in. This is what I want it to look like. And I went over to create account. And so now you could enter an email. And so I'm just going to do TT, well, I guess we'll do Todd, right? And uh, a Twitter name. And this is, notice when I did that. Here I'm getting drop down suggestions, okay, in this one. And uh, and then here, as I enter stuff, no drop down suggestions. But it is instantly checking everything in the data store to see if that username's taken. And as soon as I hit one that the username is taken, it says you can't take that, but you can have that one. Ooh, that is totally hot. I really like that, right? And, uh, and I had to get rid of this drop-down deal because if that drop-down the deal is there, then it masks my message. <laughs> so it's like, where is that, you know, I'm not seeing the message, you know. So that would be bad user experience. But so uh, that, and then my passwords, so, right, not correct passwords. Your passwords did not match. Please re-enter your passwords. Okay, one, two, three, one, two, three, create account. Oh, you need to include an actual email address. Right, so all that stuff, just to be able to choose your username, make sure your email is validated, make sure your passwords match, that's all happening JavaScript. So, you know, I am talking with the server to check, hey, does this user account exist? And I'm doing that with Ajax, right? So that's a really nice use of Ajax because, you know, uh, this will have great, uh, I was going to say backwards compatibility, but that's not the phrase, but graceful degradation. Right, great graceful degradation because if somebody doesn't have JavaScript on, which is like 0.04% of the market, <laughs> then I'm still checking everything server side. But this, you know, they just, you know, it's like, oh, your passwords didn't match, will be coming back from the server or whatever. Um, or that username's taken, will be coming back from the server. Or that's not a valid email, will be coming back from the server. So good graceful degradation. And, uh, yeah, that was uh, then I could create an account. So I just create an account. Now if I go to localhost 8000, I'm on App Engine uh, development. I can look at my data store viewer and look at my kinds. And so I have users and I list my entities. And I now have QWERTY. And uh, and you know I didn't check for this stuff, so I was just using the same thing. So I'd want to make sure that they've you. I don't know. Should I let somebody have a uh, two accounts with the same email address? It's just going to make me look like I have more users and it'll sell for more to the VCs, <laughs> right? And uh, passwords, probably shouldn't be storing passwords unencrypted. So probably encrypt the passwords. Um, any other thoughts about storing data, Daniel, here? Would we encrypt email? No, not no? actually. That's, you know, because that's pretty more like people are okay with that being out and about somewhat. But passwords, a good idea to encrypt. Yeah. 
and store just the encrypted password. And then you just always, when you check the password, whatever they enter, you encrypt it and then check equality on what you just encrypted versus what's stored as encrypted. So that's like another step that needs to be taken. So that, that's, uh, you know, doing a login and, uh, or sorry, a sign up and uh, storing it in the data store. Um, that's all I got. You guys have any questions? <laughs> What's up? How come you were using an ID and not a key? Like, how are you going to catch those, especially if you let the email key and you have to reach it? An ID and not a key. How am I going to fetch those? That's a really good point. So maybe make the email the key, right? Or when somebody logs in, I'm going to have a session, and then that session will be associated with an account, and I could grab the ID at that point. Because they logged in, I could grab the ID, but that's just one more thing to pass around. So yeah. probably better to, what are your thoughts, Daniel? Probably better to do it with. With, with the email being the key, or like a username or something being the key, it would be easier to look it up, which would be, Really, which is good for your uh, your uh, is this username uh, exist uh, Ajax? If the uh, username was the key, that's that it's just a key lookup as compared to having to do a query, which is going to be much slower. Um, and then if you needed to have like sessions and such, well then it can have the username be the uh, I, the key, it just store the username there, right? So it can look up under the data store to be. So say that all again. Having the username be the key be the key would be uh, best because you're looking that up and that's every time unique. they type a character in the uh, when they're creating an account. So you want to be, you want that to be as fast as possible, so they can get the response their feedback as fast as possible. That's something that's they're they're typing. It's going to be a live code thing. It's not like a, a web page where it's okay to take a half second, extra half second. You're there. That's happening while they're typing. So you want that to be as fast as possible. And a key, just checking if something exists, if you got the key, is pretty fast and simple compared to having to pull up a query. So you're saying this is already indexed, so don't index another field. No, I'm saying have that be your key instead of just like a, instead of using an incomplete key. Yeah, yeah. Have your username be your key. Yeah. Okay. And that way you can just create that key and ask okay. data store, Does this, okay. is there a value for this key? Okay. Which is much faster than saying. Oh, yeah, yeah, filter. Which is much faster than saying query yeah. filter on this field. Yeah. Yeah, good idea. Because the, the query has That's to go through the idea. entire data store, whereas looking up by key, it knows exactly where to look. To see That's a great idea. There. All right, so <clears throat> note to self, to do, <laughs> folder number 14, uh, username as key. So and that would be good for when they're creating the account. That needs to be as fast as possible because that's happening as they're typing. And usernames are unique, so that's how it works. Step number fourteen. So, what do you guys want to uh, see? Do you want to like go through some of this code? I mean, you could do that on your own, or do you want to talk a little bit about like where to go from here? What would you like? All those who want to go through code and do like, let's see some of the code. How you did that? Raise your hand. And it's not one or the other. Let's just say which one to start with first. You want to, you want to start with looking at code first, or you want to start talking about like how do we do the next step? I vote for how do we do the next step because that's going to help me this afternoon. <laughs> so all those in favor, of how to do the next step? Raise your hand. All those in favor of uh, first, first. How, all those in favor of looking at code first? Raise your hand. So first step, talk about where to go next. That's the first thing. Raise your hand again. We got to revote. We got to recount. One, two, three, four, five. All those who want to look at code first, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, six. Code first. You want to start right from the beginning? You want to start right from the beginning or you want to work backwards? Or just start right where we're at? Right, right where we're at. Okay. Um, so um, look at the sign up page 
And this was something, I don't know, I'd be interested to hear everyone's thoughts on this, but I wanted to not have, you know, do not repeat yourself. And so in my header file, I have this, which is basically the beginning of a document, right? And then I stopped that first header before I ended my head section, which then allows me to add things to my head section. So I have a style sheet, which is just uh, specific to this page. There's a performance consideration when it comes to that because I'm now fetching, you know, uh, this style sheet, which is the main one for the entire document, and I'm fetching this one. So I'm getting two, whereas if I jammed all that style into here, I might only be getting one. Or even none, depending on how your caching works. Or even none, depending upon how my caching works. Exactly. <laughs> right? But... Uh, then I also, uh, I'm also sending down a bigger document the first time on the initial page load, right? As opposed to, oh, now you just have to wait for, you know. So just like some different thoughts on that. But then on header two, I basically end my header stuff, right? So this stuff is also, you know, the same. And that's, that's uh, this deal up here at the top, right? Like I don't want to have to have that on every page. So just kind of interesting. What are your thoughts on that design? That's fantastic, Todd. You're a genius. <laughs> well, I don't know. I work hard. And then uh, a basic form. And uh, we've got like two different things. One of the things that tripped me up when I was uh, building this was uh, we have input fields. And then we have paragraph fields. And then uh, IDs, obviously. So the IDs are how I access it in my JavaScript. And then the names for the input fields are the value when they come through on the form. And uh, one of the things that tripped me up was for, um, for paragraphs, use text content, right? Or for other, you know, tags that contain text, use text content, and, uh, and for input fields, use value. So originally I was using text content on everything, my input fields, and like nothing was coming through. And it's like, oh, I got to use value. And with text input, there's also another one that's out there, text input verse uh, what, which one am I looking for? Text content. Text content versus inner text, right? So inner text is kind of like an older way. You read about those. Inner Explorer introduced inner text. The intention is pretty much the same with a couple of differences compared to text content. Inner text will not include text that is hidden by CSS, but text content will. Um, 24th. Outer HTML, inner HTML. So kind of some interesting stuff because there's outer HTML, inner HTML. So one of the thoughts with text content versus HTML is text content escapes it and makes it safe for cross-site scripting because it's just, just text. So uh, the JavaScript is get variables in JavaScript referencing different DOM elements. So document, query, selector, and then the ID. Now, why query selector versus get element by ID? What's the difference? Which one's newer? Query, query selector. Okay, so you also see get element by ID sometimes. People will use that. And you have to use var. So that also tripped me up. I forgot var a couple of times. I'm like, wait, it's not Go. It's JavaScript. How many people don't have much experience with JavaScript in here? Okay, cool. I don't want to be telling you things you know. And then <clears throat> username, add event listener. So what's my username? Username, 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 username. Username, right here, that ID. OK. 
Okay, so that's where we're like doing a, you know, enter your Twitter username. And I added autocomplete off, and that prevented the autocompletion. Didn't know that until yesterday when I looked it up. Is there a way to do it? Oh, autocomplete off. So username. So to the username, we're adding event listener. That code goes from here to there. Okay, that's the opening paren, that's the closing paren. And so add event listener, I don't have the documentation for JavaScript here. It takes uh, the event and then a function and then an optional false or true. And uh, I forget what the true does. We talked about that before, but you can just leave it off because it defaults to false. And so you can go MDN add event listener. Yeah, so long as you're not using an IE6, you, you, you're, you're safe to leave it off. And do you really want to spend the time to support IE6 stuff? Probably not worth it. Yes, because, and I think I saw this last year, can I use add event listener? And this is 1.38% of the market, so IE6 is probably like 0.2, and we want, we want to reach those people. Just kidding. Add event listener, 1.38% of the market is not going to be able to use your website if you use that. With, with how much add event listener adds to your stuff compared to uh, the old style, I'd say it's worth it to use add event listener. The old style of using the events would be you would use, it would have a method just like on key up and you could set that to a function. But then if you've got more than one function you want to attach to it, you have to create a separate function just to hold what was there before in addition to your own new thing. Whereas add event listener will just be able to kind of queue them all together to all run. Which is... I don't know why, like, I'm having trouble processing what you're saying. Say that again. <laughs> if you've got two different event listeners that you handlers, you have to have attached to the same thing. Okay. Then an add event listener will work. It will, uh, it will actually successfully call all of them. Hmm. Whereas the old style, you can only attach a single uh, function to the. What event. was the old style? Um, it's just a uh, it's just a member variable on on key up on key down. Huh? How do you know this stuff? Looked it up. <laughs> when? Right. Like when did you get into web programming? This summer? Yes. <laughs> Unbelievable. So I think I would actually use the input event listener for this case instead of key up. Um, if you want to look that up on uh, MDN or whatever. Yeah, so that's what I've shown right here. We have a uh, add event listener. You can look at all the different events. So I went with key up. But Daniel's saying input. Let's see what input is. The DOM input event is fired synchronously when the value of an input or text area element is changed. Additionally, it fires on content editable editors when it's content... I'm definitely using input. So, so, in the, so with the input, it won't be firing if you press like the left arrow key. It'll only be a firing when something's changed, uh, when the value is changed. Nice. Because you you don't need to recheck if the username is valid if they're just pressing the left arrow key. If you if you read something, Daniel, like when you read something, is it like always accessible then in your head? Like you read it once, it's always accessible. I know I'm being. I'm being serious, though. I'm curious. Uh, not always. Depends on how much I am. Wow. All right, so we've got, i got to read something like eight times. I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. So uh, then we have a function. And this is just to sort of console log it, because that's cool to see when you're running. I don't really want to change directories up there. Bump, 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 bump. Failed to load resource. Server response status of 404 not found. Favicon. What? I thought I got rid of fav icon. Right here, man. That's yeah. that's what re yeah, that's, that's what, what said. Okay. Uh, so Q W E R. I love seeing that. T Y Y. And then I was also logging it down here. I know you guys all have micro eyes. 
you know, but we'll see that. That's in the main. Like nothing. No, oh, yeah, we got a match. We got a match. Nothing. Cool. Uh, so console log prints out to your console JavaScript. And then new XML HTTP request, AJAX. They should have just called it AJAX. XHR open, and then I'm sending it to API check username. And then username, uh, I'm sending username value. And so that's just whatever's been entered. No JSON here. That's another place that tripped me up. At first I was like putting that all into JSON, and it's like, why? It's just a string. You could send just a string. JSON's a string. Just send this string over. I don't have to do all that JSON marshaling, unmarshaling, stringifying. Encoding, unencoding, right? <coughs> and uh, and then ready state change. We're going to do another function which goes from there to there, and uh, get the response text. And if the response text is is true because that's what I send back from the server. Then the username is taken. Try another name. Otherwise, uh, that error. That's what this is. Is the error right beneath it? That's that error. So that object shows if uh, if the username's taken. Otherwise, it doesn't. So that's that one. And then we want to uh, validate the passwords. So button submit add event listener. So click. Is that the one you'd use? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think I do the form submit. Um, because Ooh. that, yeah, attach the event. I was joking. There's a there's a better one. It, it, the uh, forms we got their submit uh, handler. Um, that happens no matter how the form is submitted, whether that's through pressing enter or. Uh, or uh, if the form is being submitted, the form. So submitted. where where did I find that method here? I'm not seeing submit nothing. So I guess I have to do form submit Indian. That's going to give me all kinds of stupidness. Yeah, it looks like it. Event reference. Event reference. Submit event is fired when the form is submitted. Note that submit is fired only on the form element, not the button or submit input. Um, so because if you're using a form, um, some forms you're able to uh, just press enter and it will submit when you're in the input area. Um, so if you just attach a click handler to the submit button, that won't fire if you just press enter, whereas this uh, submit handler will catch that. And then you can use an e-prevent default too, or prevent it from sending the normal data over if you, if you wish. So I want to attach, instead of an event listener to my button, I want to grab my form. And my form is no ID yet, right? So ID, uh, what? No code completion? ID is equal to form create user. I guess though you're supposed to do this, right? That's more style for HTML JavaScript. I believe IDs. so. I think for HTML, yeah, it's preferred to use dashes. Form create user. And then come down here. Well, I need one of these fields. Oh, I got it right there. What the heck? But I never had that ID. So that's what I called it. This has to be form then. At least I'm consistent. Form user. Is that being used anywhere? That's the only place. Yeah. It would have been nil before because you didn't have the ID in the HTML. So. All right. So here I'm going to do form uh, add event, form, form user, and then what's this? Just submit? Yep. And so when that uh, goes, E prevent default. So it's not going to submit. All right? Yep. That's so that all yeah. looks clean? Yep. This is awesome. This is like code review. <laughs> so there are a million and one uh, JavaScript events. Picking out, picking and choosing the right one can be uh, tricky. So overall, key up and key down will deal with most of your keyboard input. But then like we saw here, there's the input event. It'll do the same thing. I mean, your key, his key up worked. But the input one will be sending less, will be uh, using less bandwidth because it's not sending the signal on uh, arrow keys or control button. You're awesome, dude. So, uh, reload this page. Just make sure it works. Test through two. 
and the, t the name will be Q W E R T O O. All right, I'm going to go from the other side of the keyboard. Looks French. Puyet. And, uh, oh, so I want it, uh, when will that, that work if the passwords are not the same, right? So let's not have the passwords be the same. So this should not submit. Good, it did not. And it did. And then we should be able to see test two, one, two, three. Whoa, all of our users have the same password. Now you guys know how to hack my account, by the way. Any account. It's like... Huh? So yeah, if this is an actual server, you have you definitely want to hash or encrypt the uh, the passwords there. Better yet, if this is something high security and such, you'd want to encrypt it on the JavaScript side so that your server never even sees the unencrypted stuff. But we're not making a bank, so I don't think it's that important. <laughs> well, I think I was doing that. <laughs> Right? No, I'm not. Why is that not going? What? Because I thought that was, should be secure. I'm not getting my HTTPS. We'll debug that in a second. Yeah, we'll go through the docs and figure out what the actual, what the exact spelling is. So validating passwords. So here's another error I made earlier. You guys tell me what did I do wrong. That was there, right where the cursor is. What's wrong with that? Huh? You're not yeah. I need to not assign, but check quality. It's like the basic things. And you're like, why is that not working? So, uh, well, if the. You actually use three equals three right. two instead of two. It's yeah. JavaScript. Why? More to work. Yes. But then what if my types are different? I have to worry about that. It's JavaScript, just go typeless, man. Yeah. Um, it depends on how the JavaScript works. If it's the less secure one, it may have to be doing a bunch of conversions in the background. If you're using a type, you, the, uh, the weak equality. Hmm. All right, so then, uh, right, setting the error, resetting these if they're not equal. So returning true or false. And then just sign that to variable OK. So if it's not OK, then prevent default return. And I was like, oh, do I have to unprevent default once I set that? But each time through, like it just prevents the default for that one submit. Like, oh, we're preventing that. Right? And then it's open to being submitted again. And it'll, next time you hit submit, it runs all this. And if, you know, oh, it's still a problem, we're going to prevent that one too. But when it's not a problem, it won't prevent it. I thought I maybe had to, like, once I set prevent, I had to unset it, but you don't. It's a point of common confusion, apparently, because there's all kinds of posts on it. Then I finally read a post that said, no, it's just like, you know, next time through, it won't be, you know, you won't be preventing it. Just run it's, it once. It's, it's a new event that you have to prevent <coughs> or not prevent, so. Yeah. Well. And then I have my footer. So yeah, those headers and footers are good candidates to combine into a single file. Oh yeah, that'd like be a good idea. Two huh? lines here. Yeah, drop all those into one file. So let's do that. So I could do, uh, what would I call it? Just like uh, headers, footers? Yeah. New, and it's, uh, it's HTML. Do, do, do. Headers. What would be the best way to name that? Dashes? Underscores? Or it's, it's file system. I don't think it matters. Headers, footers. Capital, lowercase. So many choices. You're not actually even knocking. You're not even even referencing it in your code. It's being found automatically by the car squad. <laughs> so here's uh, defining my header. Come over. And then header two. And then uh, footer. So 
Sweet. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. No, I wanted that file. Ah. <laughs> That's why you use GitHub. That way you can revert your commit, revert your files. Code review and improvement. Do you know that the more commits you make, statistically, the more money you make? There's a direct correlation as a programmer. It's a study I did myself because it's a logic <laughs> study. Because if you make zero commits, you probably aren't making any money. Odds are, right? And the more you're working, the more you're committing, the more money you're making. And then nobody sees your commits. It's a secret repo. Have you guys seen the GitHub GitHub commit messages? I don't know how to bring it up. GitHub commit graph. Commit graph. People do images or words in their commits. Pack. <laughs> Yeah, was that say something? No, it's, it's just, just a day the of the week. It never works on that one day. Oh, this person did that one. <laughs> <laughs> that takes dedication to hold yourself to only committing on certain days and certain quantities. <laughs> and certain and quantities. it's relative too. So there's yeah. Git. It's relative. So as you commit too much, the colors change for everything. It's a nuts. It's a nuts world, dude. We are creating our own manacles. We switch to enslave ourselves. So uh, that's uh, the JavaScript. Um, App YAML. I thought that this would be secure, and last night it was. I don't know what happened. Serving HTTPS. Right. Anything slash, going? Slash form slash anything. Yeah, so... Is the sign-up in a slash form? Yeah, it uh, should be, right, form, login, form, sign-up. Okay. Yeah. So when I go look at that, I'm still running. I don't think you are. Right? Uh, form, sign-up. I killed it. Yeah. I did, you're right. I'm in 14, I'm in 14, I'm in the right stuff. Right, but not HTTPS. That's because it's running locally. Oh, it's because it's running locally. That's right. Yeah. So if I, uh, if I go app deploy this, thank you, which is not going to be in there because I haven't typed it yet. We'll come back to that in a second. It takes a moment. Or we'll watch it. Checking to see if it's actually finished. There we go. So uh, my mine is called a uh, twit mock ten twelve. Twit mock ten. Was, was there a dash? Twelve. Just not in that spot. Twit mock ten twelve elf spot. So now. Your HTTPS. HTTPS. Yeah. That's awesome. All right, so we got that. So, so that was working. Yeah, that was working. So yeah, running locally, it won't flip to HTTPS because you're only using localhost. It's never actually leaving your system, so it doesn't bother to encrypt it. it and, it's, and it's more work than to have to open up two separate uh, connection ports and to make it work with HTTPS and all that. Bunch extra work, and it's not even really adding anything. So locally, it ignores uh, HTTPS. But when you deploy, it does exist. So here's import aliasing. I have two, two uh, packages, both ending in log. So I'm just aliasing that one so I can access it. Are you it. using the normal log? And does the normal log even actually do anything when it's app engine? Well, app engine log will stick it into 
right, where I can access it through developer's console. Yeah, but, or the terminal if you're running locally. Really? There's, there's no uh, log system in lo running locally, so it just dumps it into the dumps oh. it in Well, that's why I did this, so I can see it locally, so I don't need that. Yeah. So anywhere I have standard log, it'll still print it out to the standard terminal. Print. I can just make that log. Yeah, but just say it changes to like info f or something, because that's what the app engine log uses. Cool. I never realized I was making this many errors. And I tried really hard. So here's my struct. What did I do wrong? <laughs> what should I not be sending over the wire? What, what tags do I need out here? Anything? This is a true teacher. You guys are learning at my expense. <laughs> Learn by tearing your teacher's code apart. It's okay. I made this mistake at one point. And then I was trying to like pass that stuff through JSON. This wasn't in, in this round of code, but a week or two ago. And it's like, wait, those aren't exported fields, so I was getting nothing. So you need the capitals. And then I create my template and then funking it. And then I'm using Julian Schmidt. I thought it was, yeah, right there, router. So I had to do, that's HP new router, but I had to do this handle thing here. And Corey, who's not here, I like the way he kind of like put that right there next to it, so that's the way I did it. And then uh, you can do these different methods here. Yeah, when I'm sending data, when the client's sending data to the server, so the form, right, checking username or that, <coughs> post versus get for these. And I'm not serving a fav icon, so return not found. And uh, and then for serving files, I need to have this in. That's to do all my CSS. And uh, and then parsing all my templates. And I do it out here so that other places have access to that. If I'd done this, I don't even know if you need the path icon. It does no longer access it. Fave icon handler. Yeah, because it'll do the same thing. Because your Julian Schmidt router does not support, does not add the extra stuff in. So uh, your r dot get, your uh, because uh, it's the Julian Schmidt router will not count this as being a match because uh, Julian Schmidt's router does not count them as being matches. So this doesn't extra. catch fave icon. Correct. So it's just really? no handler for it. It'll just say four or four. I gotta see that in action. I need to go run it. Go app gap. Go app serve. Daniel's parsing this yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah. Line 55, can't use request body as type context in go in the log error info f. What? You can't use okay, request in, body? Info f has to take it in oh. context as the first argument. Okay. We better go fix that. Info f. Those three lines there. Web store magicness. Holding out option. C. C. T. X. Good? Um, and those are f. Similar to uh, printf. So, they need so can we just do info? Um, I'm not sure. Where do we look that up? Go lang app engine. And it's probably uh, a There's service log. Yeah. And reference. And we don't have info or anything there. So that's not the place, right? Info. That's info f. Engine app, log. Info f. Info, info. Let's see if we have something under here. Info, nothing in that one. I guess info F's it. Yeah, look at look in the full, the global GitHub docs, the Go doc one. The Go doc one is generating based off the code itself, so it's definitely going to have it. Right here. 
yeah, it's a slash app engine slash blog. The go doc generates its documentation based off of the code itself. So if it exists, yeah, it'll have it. Context, format okay. strings, args. Well, this is a pain. I don't know. I think I need to go back just to print line, log, print line. It's just per I'm percent joking. V at the end of each of them. So. Uh, percent V. Percent S, or yeah, V would work, I think, best. What would you like? Percent V, or S, or F, or? I don't even v. know what the types there all we are, so we'll just let go figure string, it out. String, string, and uh, int. E. Yeah, percent V is let go figure it out. So S. Cool. Why'd we come here? What do we want to see? Favicon. Favicon. So we request it. Or, or not. It's no longer even putting anything down. Yeah, it's not being. A so info, info. Are these our logs? These aren't running yet. These aren't ours. Yeah, these are those, just. Yeah, those are just the generic. Generic head. ones. So huh, it just throws it away. Right? Yeah. Doesn't even respond. It's just like I'm eating your request. And if we have this on, so I think the web browser just isn't uh, even uh, sending the request. Um, use Control Shift R or Command Shift R for hard. Command Shift R. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Nope, all twos. Okay. Oh. Interesting. How odd. The web browser doesn't want to ask for the Pavicon anymore. Maybe not needed because of Schmidt router. Uh, next. Home. Pretty straightforward. I guess we don't need that either, right? Yeah. Julian Schmidt router deals with that. And, uh, and then just execute for login, sign up, executing templates. There's some better way to do that that seemed kind of like repetitive. But I guess that's the way, right? Yeah, I think that's the only way you can do it. And then check username and create user. It's not that much, right? I don't know why it took me hours. Uh, App Engine Context, read all the request body. This took me a little bit to figure out. Like I got to read the request body. And I get my BS, and I turn it into an SBS. And then I'm just going to log that to see what that is. And then do a new query and uh, find out what's the count. And then, so we wanted to change this, right? So let's change it to uh, data store. And don't say it yet. Let me ask you. So first of all, Golang app engine. Data store reference query which one if I'm doing it off of like hey I want to query uh, or I want I want to get a record by the key right so if I'm going to change the key to the username. Then what am I using to get the record? Am I doing a query or am I doing something else? I think it's just this one, right? Yeah. Context key, destination interface. So uh, you think that's faster to do that than a query, just get it by the key? Yep, because with the key, you know, it knows exactly <clears throat> it's here as opposed to the query it says, okay, I've got to search for it. So to do that, I'm going to need a var, and I'm not passing the user back. User, right? And then, is that correct? Don't I think it's you users. Don't curly brace, just the user. User. Leave it, it, That's leave right. It empty. And then uh, that goes to uh, zero values. Yeah. And then I'm going to do uh, git. And I have to, and what's that return? It returns an error, which uh, you just throw away. And I don't even need it. 
So uh, data store get context key destination. Context key is going to be. You got to create it. Yeah, how am I going to uh, key and then the interfaces? I think it's uh, like that, right? Yep. <clears throat> so I got to create my key. How do you guys create the key? New incomplete key or new key? Which should I use? What do you think? New key, right? I need the context. I need kind. I need one of these. And optionally a parent key that returns a key. So key will be equal to that is for new key. Test store new key. Context. Kind is users. And string ID. String ID. Which will be the username. Username. So where am I getting username from? SBS. I got that. I got that. But SBS is my request body. And my request body is uh, asking for that username. SBS and uh, and then nil. Zero nil. Zero nil. Zero nil. There we go. No Zero. ancestor. We don't have a, we don't have an integer ID, so zero for that. So we so get that. Actually, uh, data store get. Look at the uh, docs for data store get because um, error no such entry. Yeah, that's so we do so need the error. The error. So. Uh, <clears throat> Error. And it's already been used up there, so. So then you just check if error is no such entry, then you'll be uh, sending back the uh, true, and otherwise you'll be sending back the false. So, uh, if error is not nil, <coughs> wouldn't nil work? Yeah. Because if it's a. Uh, yeah, it's no such net entity, it's not nil, so. Work. So uh, if we don't find anything, we have an error, and this is saying error is non-nil, meaning there is an error, meaning, okay, it's false, right? We found something. And then else would be where the return true, would be the other if else, because you don't have a chance of uh, having no results like you do in, uh, with the query. All right. All right, so if we find no, if uh, we, I think this is backwards actually. If we find nothing, there's no, this means, hey, there's no user, right? Correct. And so here, if uh, that is equal to this, nope. if, it's, if there's no error, meaning there is a user, then that's false, right? And so false then is. So if error is not nil, that means there is an error which means there's no user, which means false is what you send back. So if we get true, that's where we're saying username's taken. Like, hey, it's true. Right, so if there's no error, that's fine. Right? Yeah. Wait, no, because error is there's no user. This is like saying there is a user, okay. and we're saying false. Isn't that yeah, right? Yeah, they're reversed. Yeah, so that just needs to be yeah, true, and that needs to be false. You always see a flowchart diagram for some of the interactions between programming languages here. Like, what's the server now? If what's there the is, now? there is an error, there is no user, right? And so here we're saying uh, it's open and available. There, there, uh, error is non-nil. There is an error. There is an error. So there is. Uh, a user, right? So that's true, that's taken. And over here... Now, if there is an error, there is no user because it's no entity not found. 
If there is an error, there is no user. <clears throat> right, that's what, right there. And so error is non-nil, meaning there's an error. It's not a nil. So there is an error, so there is no user. No user. <laughs> so no user means when we come over here, if it's true, username is taken. So true, true that we found something. So uh, true, we found something. That would be false. Oh, true. It's, it's true is true is it's available. The username is available because there's an error saying that it doesn't exist when you looked it up. But over here, I'm saying that, so I need to change yeah. this to false. Right? Yeah. You know? Like I said, you need a diagram for some of these interactions. Either way, right? So item, uh, bar item, item false. Yeah, we don't even have to guess. We can go into I want item to be true. Like, no, there is an item, right? So there is an item. And uh, if there there is an error, there is no user. Uh, so here, there is no user. There is an error, so there is, there is no user. And so there is no user means false. And this is true. And this means that here, uh, item is true. There is something. Uh, so there with is this, something. With this much complicated interaction, though, this is definitely a time when I would go check it and make sure that I, what I'm thinking is actually what the computer is thinking. That looks right. <clears throat> Let's check it. Do you guys have these problems or is it just me? I, I don't have a peer group. I'm like one guy who somehow got hired to teach computer stuff and like I'm learning out there kind of like on my own. So it's nice for me to check in with you. Do you guys, you know, logic, right? We, we have that in like, uh, like writing and stuff, like working and multiprocessing and such. Yeah. yeah. It's Figuring it's out what's big, what, what, yeah. what. <laughs> like when you actually uh, run something. What does this know? What does this like, know? Where, where does, this does, know? Yeah. does this exist? Yeah. It no longer works <laughs> at all. Either when it finds it or doesn't find it. Let's check to see for. Oops. <clears throat> still getting our logs. Request body. So yeah, we're still getting our logs. Quirk, 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 quirk. No such entity. Error, no such entity. It's not nil. It's because no we such haven't entity. updated our data store yet with the new keys. Ah, uh, cool. We got to fix that. So yeah, our check username is probably good. Our create user has to be updated. All right, so uh, create user. And so here we have a uh, context and then a new user. And we're getting this stuff from the form. And then uh, new and complete, we want to do new key. And our new key is going to be context and then users. And, uh, and then we're passing in for the key is going to be uh, uh, new user dot user name. And then zero and nil. And then put that. And uh, this is the only error checking. Maybe there's other error checking that's needed and then redirect. Okay, so let's add a user. Let's just make sure that's saved. Cool, and let's go here and delete all of our other people. And that's so this is a great example of schemaless. We don't care. Change it is what it says, right? So I'm going to delete that. And do I, uh, should I even store a username anymore field? Like, it's redundant, right? It makes it easy to get it back out. So maybe in the future. But I'm, do I just get it by key? I know yeah, the key is the username. Yeah, you, you can do so. You can so do that. I think it's that's just... cleaner just to get rid of username. So how would we uh, say don't use this data store? Bueller, 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 Bueller. How do we say don't use this data store? Well, can I just do that? Would that be one way? It's not exported? No, that doesn't work. Because then it? it wouldn't go across the JSON either. 
So we need to do, uh, where do we find our flags? We go to our documents, and there's tags. So tag, and uh, this is the one we want right there. Okay, so let's go create a new user. Save this. And this one will be test and QWERTY. <clears throat> we'll do it. Hound dog. So let's go see what that did. So no username. Let's delete this dude. Don't, don't bother going to the key. Click the key. Click, click its value. You can just empty the string there. Save changes. Oh, okay. So cool. That field's gone now. So uh, why wasn't that working? Should be working, right? So uh, maybe over would it be in our JavaScript? Like we are uh, checking and we're sending stuff back. So let's log in our JavaScript. See what's happening. So where might we log? Here we're logging user value, right? Every time they type. Yeah. And uh, and then I think we would like to log maybe item. Like what item is? Yeah. That might be a good deal to log. See what we're getting. Cool. <laughs> Test example two. H O U N D D O G. Yay! Why it works now and not before? Not Hound before. doggy. One, two, three. Too many. One, two, three. One, two, three. I don't know why two ended up out there. Sweet. Dude, that is like awesomeness. I think I just have to know Twitter. Like I gotta just go see, right? Like search Twitter, hound dog. Who are we uh, getting in touch with? Is there no hound dog on Twitter? How do you get to the at hound dog? Is it that? That's how I get to. I I don't use Twitter. I though I. Here we go. Here's Hound Dog. Joined August two thousand seven. Hasn't tweeted yet. Woof woof woof. There we go. Let's see if we get him going. <laughs> how many people found today uh, educational? You learned some. How many people did not? Cool. So, uh, what? Anything else here you would add, Daniel? Um, I think I need to rechange this first of all. This has to become fifteen. Uh, username key, and uh, oh, we did that here. So fifteen, but this one is uh, code review, and uh, this one's something else. I'm not sure what's going to be yet. What else, Daniel? Um, well, you said the uh, no duplicate emails. Yeah, so that's just another thought, right? That's, that's another thought. Um, so then another thing I would think of would be uh, the header. You've got your header, and it always gives the login button. What if you're already logged in? Oh, yeah, we got to change so that. So once Sessions comes along, and you can yeah. actually have, be fully logged in. So I think the next thing is Sessions. So to do... To do is a session, uh, which is going to entail uh, UUID and uh, so session is going to need a UUID in a cookie, and then where are we going to reference that? Are we going to do data store every time? Or are we going to use memcache, right? You know, for you know, like only in the cookie, let's store the UUID. And then we could reference that, and we could pull out data from memcache. And if we need something permanently stored, we could stick it in the data store. And if it's not in memcache, we could grab it from the data store and load it into memcache. 
So that's like we have to do our session, right? It almost sounds like a good function, a function for getting, if you've got the UUID, it gives you the user's name, user's data. The user's data will usually be in the, will be in the data store usually, but then it'll look up the map memcache first. And if it's not memcache, load it from data store into memcache and then send it back. Yeah. So what what would be the next steps in building this? What are your thoughts, Daniel? Because I know my thoughts. I want to hear your perspective. So yeah, the sessions would be obviously uh, something needed. Um, after the sessions, <laughs> yeah, with the sessions, we've got to have a login, log out, um, which means you're going to need to change the template a bit. Um, you need to, uh, well, it's, it's a Twitter thing, right? So uh, you'll need to be able to friend or follow other people. So you yeah, post tweets, which need to go on the main page. See tweets, and if you're following people, filter your front page to uh, only be the people you're following. This is a lot. It's a big project. So the place I was stuck was, uh, I mean, this is kind of like the thing where I was like um, implementing the session. So we said, okay, there's a couple ways you could do it. Straight up, you could just do it Google. And that's pretty easy. Login required. Um, but if we wanted to implement our own session, then we have to do some UUID, right? So if we're storing a UUID in a cookie, then, you know, uh, do we need to encrypt UUID? And encrypting UUID is uh, different than HMAC, right? So what are your thoughts on that? Everyone, Daniel. If it's a bank website, yes, right? Because we don't want session hijacking. How does a session get hijacked? Somebody's watching wire traffic, they see a session ID go over, they grab that session ID, they create a cookie with that session ID, they then go to you know, uh, the website and they're logged in as you. They have your session, they've hijacked your session. If we've encrypted the UUID, well they intercept a string of junk, right? And then they don't know how but then they, they could take that string of junk, couldn't they? And, uh, and then just create a cookie of that string of junk and then send that to us. And we're the ones decrypting it. So we're like, cool, you had the right UUID. So how did encryption help? <laughs> Not at all for this and, one. And how did HVAC even help, right? So, like, well, it hasn't been tampered. It's exactly the same stuff. So with that, you would be using HTTPS. Um, so uh, the entire... Uh, Entire message is encrypted, so they don't know which parts of it are the cookies and which parts are not. Um, so in that case, don't bother encrypting the UID. You're already got the entire message encrypted. So do you do uh, if you use HTTPS? That's got to be for the entire time you're logged in. Yeah. So basically, like set up our whole site HTTPS. If if you need that kind of security, yeah. And what's the what's the downside of setting up your whole site HTTPS? Is there a performance it's, cost? Yeah, there's a performance cost because you are doing the encryption. However, the HTTPS encryption is so commonly used that there's usually hardware support for it. So it's not actually that much of a cost. So if you were, if you need good security, the whole site HTTPS. Could you go? How hard would it be to be like you're not logged in? You could see everything. It's HTTP. And then you're logged in. You could still see the same pages, but now you're seeing them say HTTPS. Like, do you have to have a, a mirror site because you know an app engine? Because here we're doing, you know, like this well, stuff. Would you well, just whenever, be like every? Our normal URL is saying that any either one will work, but when going to form, it'll flip to HTTPS. So long as your URLs don't change it, they can go back when they go back to the normal site. They'll still be HTTPS. So as long as they don't actually go into the barcode and change it back to HTTP. Oh, so when you go back to home here, we're still HTTPS. So what was my, uh, is it up? It's not. It's twit. Twit. 
So now I'm HTTPS, and now I go back home. I'm still going to be HTTPS, you're saying? Yeah. What do you know? That's cool. I didn't know that would happen. So yes, yeah, so unless they actually go actively going into the URL bar and changing themselves back to HTTP, you're good. Um, the HMAC will prevent it from being uh, changed in your cookie. Um, oh. <laughs> yes, yeah, security is a big, big thing, and uh, usually, if you need the security like really badly. Uh, you were going to hire a security expert because it's such a big field that there are people who oh, just dude, I'm just going to hire you. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a, so to hell with encrypting or anything, the UUID. And if you uh, create a session, you might think about doing it all HTTPS. Uh, so uh, I would do uh, HTTPS while logged in. You know, maybe. Right, and then your UID is encrypted. Otherwise, you're passing that over the wire. Depends upon security. On security required. Right? Does that make sense? Yep. And uh, and then the next thing, uh, do we uh, encrypt password on app, uh, data store? And then yeah. after that, use memcache. Yeah. You so, should always have. You should never store an unencrypted password. Never store an unencrypted password. So, resoundingly, yes. <laughs> and how do we encrypt that one? What do you think? Just like uh, there's AES, right? Like I was reading about AES last night. Go, Go's got a bunch of different crypto libraries. Most of them would work. Um, like, because the, the Caleb goal, was the, saying, the like, goal is if someone gets into Google and grabs a random hard drive, they don't have your list of passwords sitting there on said hard drive. I think the odds of that happening are pretty low, but yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, hash, uh, there's like SHA one, right? It's been broken. Yeah. Right. And SHA two fifty six, is that still good? Can we just do a yeah, SHA yeah. on it? Well, the hash is. The downside to the hashes is hashes are designed to be a quick and fast way of checking. So the problem with the hashes is they are fast, so it's easy to brute force it. Just try one after another until you get one that matches. So you, what you ideally want for storing encrypting a password is one where it takes a second or two for the encryption so that brute forcing is less possible. But that's going to slow all of our perf down every time somebody logs in. We're taking a second, or is it only for that one user? It's taking a second. It's just for that one user because you're using separate Go routines for each connection. Okay, so uh, SHA two fifty six be fast, not totally secure. Is SHA two fifty six secure? I believe uh, for uh, breaking wise, I think it's still secure. But we're kind of out of time, so. Well, we can keep going. We can attack with it. Unless anyone else has got classes afterwards. <laughs> so uh, SHA-256, not totally secure, or what's the other one? AES, is that the one you do? 256 is secure. 256 is secure in the, in the sense that you can't just see the final uh, hash value and come up with something that makes that same hash. Um, but it is still, but it's such a fast algorithm still that you can brute force a, your way into finding something that matches. Uh, I think that's secure enough for us. And then uh, I think this is interesting, but you guys got a couple more minutes? So memcache, using memcache, I guess that's something to explore and think about. Like, hey, it'd be cool to like have stuff in memcache because it's so much faster. Take, for example, our templates. We're putting together three sub-templates within our big, larger template. So if you were to take that entire template and just throw it into a memcache, uh, a completed template into the memcache, then the other people who come to the site will be able to just pull that out of the memcache and not have to worry about inserting stuff all over the place. Wait, say that again. So how do we, these right here? Yeah. Home, login, sign up? Yep. Yeah. So Does, they're, all, they're all running through a template system which has to insert, I put together. So these temp this templates. template's right here, we stick that into memcache? No, there's just these XQ templates. There's four. There's four different uh, sub-templates that have to go together to make that web page. Mm -hmm. So if you were to move that result into, uh, into memcache, the completed one, 
then in the future you can just grab the complete web page out of memcache. I gotta see that. So that right. that's that's a bit complicated, but it's a way to speed yourself up. Although Go is fast enough that you usually don't have to care. All right, see you guys. And gals. <laughs>